All right, so we're at about two after, so uh, we'll get started. I'm sure some other folks will file in, and uh, if you're just joining us, feel free to drop in the chat where you're joining us from, um, particularly if you're with a, an online program or a school that's doing some blended learning. We'd uh, just love to get a sense as to both geographically and uh, program-wise where folks are. Uh, so I'm Michael Barber, and my colleague, well, I was going to point in that direction because he's up in that corner of my screen. Um, my colleague, Randy Labonte, with the Canadian eLearning Network are here. And uh, we're here to talk about our annual study, the uh, State of the Nation K-12 eLearning in Canada. Um, so to get us started, um, this is the, the 15th year that we've done this report. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to go back and look at some of the others, uh, I'd encourage you to do so. Um, we initially started with the North American Council for Online Learning, and which became the International Association for K-12 Online Learning, um, NACL, then INACL. Um, and for the last, I guess it's nine or 10 years now, I think it's nine years, we've been doing this under the uh, banner of the Canadian eLearning Network. And um, the folks that uh, uh, are sponsors that we have available. Um, Dean, both the recording and the slides will be available, so I'll put the slides will be up on SlideShare, and uh, everyone who registered will get an email that gives them a link to both uh, the SlideShare as well as the YouTube recording, so that way uh, you can get uh, all of the information there, so you don't have to worry about trying to capture things as we go, although most of this is actually taken directly from the report. Uh, before I get into the actual focus on the report, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, thank our sponsors once again. Um, I'll be perfectly honest and say that if it wasn't for our sponsors, we likely would have given this up after um, 10 year was probably the, the year that we seriously considered it the most, um, both because online learning had sort of become ingrained across the country and folks were familiar with it. Um, and uh, really there wasn't a lot of changes that were happening around that period of time. So, but it's the sponsors that uh, keep encouraging us to, to continue to do this and uh, keep funding um, the ability for Randy and I and the others that are involved in it uh, to continue to do it. Um, so, um, you know, we're, we're very grateful for them and, and uh, without them, this, this study simply wouldn't exist anymore. Um, so I mentioned the, the 15 different reports, and if you haven't been to our website yet, I would strongly encourage it. Uh, in particular, there's a, a data and information section where you have the ability to drill down on an individual province or territory or the federal jurisdiction. Um, and one of the nice things about that, while it gives you the complete profile for this particular year, there are also links to every other profile that we've got. So you'll see like links to all 15 um, Ontario profiles or BC profiles. So you can literally go from, you know, 2016 and 2017 and 2018 and sort of track how things have changed at a, a province by province, territory by territory level. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff that we've got there, including links to both the annual reports and our special reports. Uh, we pull out all of our specific brief issue papers there. Uh, all of the vignettes that actually many of the people in the room have contributed to are linked into the the the, the provincial and territorial profiles that you find in there, uh, as well as the most recent um, submission to the individual program surveys for everyone is there. And if there's anyone in the room who hasn't uh, completed their individual program survey, um, I'd encourage you to go in and do it. And usually once the report has been published, we go in about once a week or so, and anyone who's newly submitted their information will go in and update that in their particular uh, province or territory. Um, so for those of you who are new to the, um, the the study, to give you a sense as to how these come about, um, basically Randy and I rely fairly heavily upon the, the Ministries of Education, and, and um, we thank them for their participation in, in the report every year. Uh, sometimes the information that they send us based upon the initial survey, we need to go back to them several times, either through email or um, has scheduling calls to, to figure out exactly what's happening. Uh, we look at a lot of public information from reports and, and policy documents that they've got online to just general media stuff. And then in all honesty, interacting with folks like you. Um, there's, as most of you know, there's a big difference between, well, the ministry regulation says this is the way it's supposed to work and the way in which it actually ends up working at the ground level when you guys are implementing a lot of these things. 
Um, so those interviews with key stakeholders that we do, um, we do them in every jurisdiction, and um, they they do factor into to the profiles that we do for all of them. You'll see in a minute there are sections where we specifically mention key stakeholders in our data collection, and those are areas where the actual profile was more heavily influenced by what we heard from those on the ground as opposed to what we we're able to get from the ministries and other public publications. Um, and then there's also the individual program surveys and, and from those surveys, we also do a lot of follow-up interviews, uh, which is actually where a lot of those vignettes come from. Um, so if you're looking at it, this is sort of a cross section of the last five years. So you can get a sense as the, the consistency of data collection. Um, you'll notice that in most years, uh, for most jurisdictions, the ministries have been our primary source of information. Uh, you'll see that there's a lot of KSs there, uh, key stakeholders. So um, you'll see that in some cases, we tend to verify a lot more and tend to use a lot more of what you tell us uh, than, than what the, the ministries have indicated is the way it should work. Uh, although that varies from year to year and, and, and jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, some ministries are, are quite... Um, open and upfront about, you know, this is how it works. And when we talk to folks on the ground, that's pretty much how it goes. In other cases, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a disconnect there. Um, in terms of the individual program surveys, as of the printing of the report, this was the response rate that we got. Um, this has been typical since COVID hit. Uh, so starting with our 2019-2020 report, so the last three reports have pretty much looked uh, something like this. Uh, but if you go back and sort of look at our historical response rate, uh, you see that it's a much different perspective that you find there. Uh, so in most jurisdictions, we tend to be hearing from anywhere from a third to a half of the, the, the programs that operate in that jurisdiction. Uh, one of the main outliers, and if there's anyone here from Manitoba, we would love your help on this. Uh, but for one reason or another, Manitoba is a jurisdiction where we just haven't had a lot of participation in the individual program surveys, uh, both on an annual basis, plus when you look at just the number of people we've heard from since we've started uh, incorporating this feature, which started around, I guess, year seven or year eight of our reports. So we've been doing it now for about um, eight or nine years um, in terms of collecting this data. So looking at what's happening across the country. Um, as you can see here, there's been a great deal of consistency in terms of, of how people are, are regulated or how they are governed when it comes to online learning. Although there's a bit of a, a, a misnomer that you find here. So you'll see most jurisdictions have some reference to um, some reference to distance education in the legislation. And um, but in most cases, it's usually a single line or two that says the Minister of Education uh, has the ability to regulate or is responsible for governing distance education within the province. Um, and that's literally all that they have. Uh, two of the main exceptions that we find right now, and it's been consistent since we've started doing this report, uh, Nova Scotia uh, has uh, a full uh, section of their collective agreement that the government passes into law uh, that's negotiated with the Nova Scotia Teachers Union uh, that deals with distance education. If my memory serves me correct, it's down to 14 clauses now. It used to be 16. Uh, they've streamlined some of it. And then in uh, British Columbia, there's a section uh, of, of both the Schools Act and the Independent Schools Act that deals specifically with uh, what historically would have been called distributed learning, but with the updates that we've seen over the last couple of years, uh, they are now terming online learning. Uh, so all of the other jurisdictions that you see there, the legislative language refers to basically just a sentence or two uh, that you find. So when you look at what actually governs things, in most cases, it's a combination of a policy handbook and some uh, form of agreement, either a formal memorandum of understanding or a contract type agreement that districts have to um, agree that they will abide to or divisions have to agree that they will abide to as they partake in various parts of the, the distance education environment that's provided by the ministry, at least in the cases where it is. Looking at uh, the type of programming we see across the country, um, there's been a, 
certain parts of this map have had a fair degree of consistency and then other parts have had a fair amount of change. And the usefulness of this kind of delineation is actually starting to um, lessen over time. Uh, so historically, the um, Atlantic Canadian provinces have tended to have their own province-wide systems that have often been operated directly out of the ministry, or in the case of Newfoundland and Labrador, it was in the ministry for a while, then it went to the single school district that was in the province, and now both the school district and the minister and the online program are heading back into the Department of Education. Um, in Quebec, there's not as much activity happening. Uh, there are a couple of pro uh, programs that operate on a provincial scale, uh, some that operate at the, the, the district level. Um, what we see in the rest of the country then sort of is where we see a lot of the changes happening. Uh, so for those of you who are in Ontario, you know that um, over the last couple of years, the, the ministry has um, decided to centralize more and more of their programming that they offer. Not that it wasn't a fairly centralized system in the past, um, you know, with a centralized LMS, a centralized course repository that you had access to with the school boards being the ones who are actually managing uh, the day-to-day -day operations of the programs. Uh, but you're seeing even more of that being pulled into the ministry now, particularly with the Independent Learning Center. Uh, Manitoba really hasn't changed uh, much at all. They offer a provincial uh, system that's managed at the district level. Uh, they also have a couple of province-wide programs that they've put in place. Uh, uh, they were calling them pilots for a while, but they're now uh, part of the official ecosystem there. Um, Saskatchewan is an interesting one because it's one that has changed uh, since we've been watching it, and, and it will change again when we do the report next year. Uh, so Saskatchewan originally had a system very much like Manitoba, where they had multiple province-wide distance learning programs that districts could take advantage of or could do their own thing. Uh, the province decided to get out of the business of distance learning and devolved it all to the uh, school districts and even provided them with bridge funding to allow them to um, build their own capacity or purchase capacity in other jurisdictions. Uh, and uh, that's been the model that we've had for the last five or six years. And uh, for those of you following the announcements, or if you've been watching the blog entries that have been coming up on the State of the Nation page, you've noticed that uh, they're moving in the opposite direction now, and they've actually contracted, or they are naming one of the online programs that are in existence a, as their province-wide provider. Uh, so they're going to centralize a lot of that again. Um, Alberta, being the, the outlier of the group, um, has gone in the actual opposite direction. Uh, so they had a successful uh, province-wide program that had been in existence for decades. Um, and, and Frank is here and correct me if I'm wrong, but I vaguely remember something about a 90th anniversary at one point in the recent years, uh, which then the ministry decided they were no longer going to support. Uh, so now... Um, all of the online learning at, uh, within the province has um, is offered at the, the district level or through uh, partnerships between districts, uh, which is similar to what we've had in BC for a long time now, although they're moving towards a more centralized model as well. Uh, so right now it says primarily district-based programs. Uh, what's going to happen in BC next year is they're going to turn purple if we were continuing to use uh, this kind of model. Uh, because they're going to have some schools that are designated as provincial online schools and have the ability to enroll students from uh, anywhere in the province. Others that will be designated just as district online schools and will only be able to enroll students from their own program. Um, and it's going to be, I think, a two-year process for the existing system to phase out and this new system to come into play, um, at least two years from the data that we're looking at in this particular report. Uh, the North has been very much the same. Um, we have two territories that are uh, have their own internal programs that they've been developing, although in all three of them, they still have a heavy reliance upon distance learning programs from the South. If we look at how the, I guess, proportion of students that are engaged in online learning uh, has changed over time. Uh, the first time anyone ever bothered to count, uh, actually it was a report that the Canadian Teachers Federation did back in 2000, and they estimated in the previous year that roughly 
25,000 students were engaged in online learning, which at the time was about half a percent of all K-12 students in the country. Um, you can see that we started the report um, in 2009, and that's all where all the rest of the numbers come. Um, and while we started off putting tildes and ranges and stuff in there to indicate approximates, we stopped that over time. But the reality is, is that's still largely the case. Um, some jurisdictions are very good at tracking their their numbers. They can tell you that they have, you know, 63,551 students that have done at least one course. And if we asked them how many had done two or three, they'd be able to give us those numbers as well. They'd be able to break it down to these are the ones that are going like full time compared to these are the ones that are only taking, you know, a, a supplemental version or one or more courses. Uh, there are other jurisdictions that basically we've never been able to get hard numbers out of. Uh, we get a round number. Um, usually it's a round number in the thousands. So um, 55,000 or 45,000. So not even at the hundreds or 500s uh, level. Uh, so while we have specific numbers listed here, uh, those should be considered sort of estimates or approximations. Um, those are the numbers I would say that we are sure about. Uh, so there's likely more out there because I suspect most ministries are undercounting a, a lot of these. Uh, but one of the things that you'll notice when you look at the sort of tra trajectory over time is really we had about a decade where it was in that five to six percent range. And it pretty much stayed in that five to six percent range for that entire decade. Um, and then COVID hit and you can see that we had a, a, a pretty big jump, um, a percent, almost a percent and a half. Uh, in that first year of, uh, after COVID hit. Um, and now we're starting to see the numbers go back to that sort of normal, just a little bit above or just a little bit below what the previous number is. Uh, so this 2020-21 number is probably a little bit inflated uh, because of the COVID concerns. And um, you know we're starting to get back to that sort of natural line of growth here. If you're looking at that on a province by province basis, you see that there's great variation. Uh, and that's one of the things I think to note. While we're looking at you know roughly eight percent nationwide, uh, when you look at what that means from province to province, um, there are some that are 50, 40 percent higher than that national average, and then some that are only um, you know 20 percent, 15 percent of that national average. Uh, we've got a couple, as you'll see there, particularly if you look at um, Ontario is close, Quebec is close. Um, you know, those are close to the national average, uh, but Atlantic Canada and the North tend to be below the national average. Most of the Western provinces uh, tend to be above the national average, and that's been a consistent thing that we've been seeing. Um, Alberta and BC in particular have tended to be in the double digit range, so at least one out of every 10 kids. And it's been that way in the case of BC for about a decade, in the case of Alberta for about the last five or six years. Um, Saskatchewan, you'll notice, is in the double digits in terms of percentages right now, and uh, that's a new thing. They've been sort of roughly at the national average, if you look at it, for over previous years, and now they're starting to move into where their other Western counterparts are. Um, the sort of exception to this rule in terms of the, the trend that we're seeing here is in Manitoba. Uh, they're the only Western jurisdiction that aren't well above the national average uh, when we look at these. And you can sort of see the, the, the trending over, if you look at the last four years, uh, where we've gone. Um, you know, if you look at, and if we had had enough real estate on the screen, if I were to do a 10-year chart, one of the things you could see is there's those jurisdictions that stay roughly the same. Uh, you look at, you know, a lot of your Atlantic Canadian ones, even for that matter, in the case of Manitoba, um, the North, uh, there's these little incremental increases uh, or you've had roughly the same number, give or take a percentage point or two. Um, the jumps that we've seen in terms of proportions in the five years leading up to the 2019 year. And then if you were basically if we could erase this and just put a black line there, you would see a nice sort of level trajectory on a lot of these ones. And I don't know if folks can see the video or not, but I was sort of doing a uh, a line going up kind of thing. Uh, whereas this one is where we, the 2020-21 is where we see a, a much higher proportional increase than we've seen in others. Uh, having said that, the numbers continue to go up. Uh, 
And some of these are really important because if you look at Ontario as an example, you know, there's only 139,000. I say only, they're the largest one there, but only 139,000 students that were engaged in online learning according to uh, the, the data that we've been got, uh, that we're able to, to get. Um, if you look at once the, assuming that none of the students in the province opted out of the online learning mandate that was introduced two years ago, uh, what you would have is you would have an annual need for approximately 300,000 uh, enrollments in e-learning every single year. You know, 300,000 enrollments would be basically 75% of the national number right now. Uh, so the province of Ontario, as we start to look at the next four or five years, really have, will have the ability to be responsible for half or more of the overall enrollment that we see across the country because of this, um, this I, I think what the, what do they call it? Optional mandate is I think what our, our partners in, in the province have been calling it, uh, or optional requirement. Yeah, that's the word, optional requirement is what they've been calling it um, because it's required, but you can opt out. Um, so I see a question in the chat there. Um, no, th so this is folks that have done at least one course, uh, Carol. Um, so these aren't people who are doing 100% of their learning online. These are people that have uh, taken at least one or more courses in some distance format. And in some jurisdictions, that still does mean through a correspondence format, although that's becoming rarer and rarer. Um, one of the big things that we've noticed, um, and this is actually a table that we've never included in, in the report before, uh, but one that we've noticed, um, I guess, in the COVID kind of times uh, as, as being important in certain jurisdictions is the number of programs. Um, so really, if you look at sort of the first three years as a group, and then you look at the last two uh, as a group, uh, one of the things that we find is that um, in the last couple of years, we've seen significant increases in a number of provinces in the number of online programs or distance learning programs that are operating. Uh, so since we were just talking about Ontario, if you look at Ontario, um, we were looking in the 70-80 range, which was roughly uh, basically one per school district. And the reason the number dropped so much there is because we stopped counting the Francophone boards um, individually um, because they were uh, basically starting to report their numbers in a single entity through Califlow at the time. Um, but you see, and then roughly, so it's the school boards and then roughly about 10 or so private programs uh, that these four years are. Um, while you still have just the school boards, you can see a significant increase in the number of programs. You know, they went from about 70 to 72 um, up to 248. And that growth is almost exclusively from uh, private online programs that are now operating in the province. So that means that there's roughly, what, 150, 100, and, what's the number there, 170 uh, new Private online pro. I'm an old social studies teacher, so yeah, 240 minus 70 is the math that you know challenges us old time social studies teachers. But um, you know that that 170 extra folks there or extra programs there are all private programs, uh, which you know in in a, a country and a province that sort of prides itself in its public education system, um, the introduction of the online learning mandate has, you know, created that sort of private online model that we see here um, in terms of that jump. Uh, we see similar numbers in terms of, of Saskatchewan and Alberta, although I would say that these are more pandemic related. Uh, so you can see, you know, in the year prior to the pandemic or the year the pandemic started, so not the one that was planned for, uh, you had numbers that were fairly consistent um, you know, 15, 14, 16, 32, 33, 34. But then, uh, at least in the case of Saskatchewan, the year after the pandemic, we saw a big jump. And then we saw another big jump this year uh, that took two years for that jump to materialize in, in Alberta. But we still see, you know, another 30% uh, new programming that's being offered. And um, I suggest that this is probably both a combination of uh, the pandemic and the loss of the EDLC 
uh, that happened, I guess it was at the end of the 2019-2020 school year, if I remember correctly. Um, the report also talks a little bit about remote learning. Uh, and if you haven't checked out the Can -E Learn uh, reports on remote learning, there are uh, seven of them now that we've been doing over that period of time. Um, and in terms of the last one, one that actually we did both in French and English, which we're quite proud of. Um, so I'd encourage you to check those out because over the last three State of the Nation reports, uh, we've talked about remote learning. Uh, it's not included in the data that we produce. Uh, the data that we produce is focused specifically upon our traditional distance and online learning. It's not focused upon this temporary or these temporary measures or temporary programs that were put in place for the sole purpose of addressing um, or accommodating students who weren't able to learn online and, and those programs that will disappear uh, once the um, emergent nature of the pandemic has sort of disappeared. Uh, so if you want to find out more about those, and we've included the summary that we uh, have from each of these reports in the last three, uh, but if you want to dive deeper into that, including looking at each of the individual provincial profiles, um, I'd encourage you to, to look through those. And I'm sure Randy, who's been dropping links and other comments in the chat as we've been going, uh, will drop the links for those two uh, in there. Um, in terms of looking at some trends nationwide, because I know that each of you are coming from individual jurisdictions, um, and you know, I, I'd encourage you to go and look at the website to see what's happening in your particular jurisdiction and how that might be changing. Uh, but we see some sort of trends that are happening across the country uh, that are things that likely you would want to be aware of because where it's happening so much, uh, there's the great possibility that it could uh, end up happening in your jurisdiction as well. Um, so one of the things that we're, we're starting to see now that uh, we're two or three years into the pandemic is this um, trying to figure out what the new normal is going to look like when it comes to the role of online learning. And that varies from, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but uh, we are seeing um, some things that are consistent on an international stage, and then some things I would say that are specific to the Canadian context. Uh, some of the things that are consistent, I would say across the board, regardless if I was doing this presentation for a, a group of Kiwis or a group of Americans or a group of, of Aussies or any of my European colleagues, um, folks are much more aware of online learning, and there seems to be a much greater interest in being at least somewhat prepared for online learning. Um, unfortunately, that interest and awareness oftentimes doesn't translate into a greater knowledge of how to do online learning, in particular, a greater knowledge of how to do online learning well. Um, so, and that's something I think that as folks who, and looking at the names in the room here, as folks in many cases who have been leaders in distance and online learning in your individual districts, and in some cases in your across the province uh, for years, um, you know, this is an area I think that we need to become much more involved in as a field. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of collective knowledge and wisdom just in this Zoom room um, here today with the, the 19 of us that we've got here. Um, most ministries of education would benefit from the collective wisdom in this room. The vast majority of school districts and school boards across the country would benefit from the wisdom in this room. So for us trying to get our story out and trying to help folks understand the difference between what we've seen a lot of in the past couple of years and what we've been doing for the past decade is important to make sure that, that we get those stories out. So if I could make a plea to you folks um, as part of this and not out to folks like Randy and I, but you know, out to your local uh, communities. Um, you know, most of you are, are, are served by some sort of local media that um, would probably benefit from hearing some of the stories of success that you guys have had over the years and how that's continuing. Um, one of the other things we're starting to see with this new normal, I, I alluded to it earlier, is this idea that if you were to erase the 2020-21 year in terms of numbers, um, for the most part, we're starting to see general trends that we've seen over the years starting to reappear. Um, and then the other thing that we're seeing, and, and this is, again, consistent regardless of jurisdiction, um, online learning 
because of the pandemic has become much more of a political aspect of it. And in some jurisdictions, it was that way beforehand. Um, you know, Alberta has, has often had um, instances where uh, because of funding or because of programmatic items that online learning has become political. We've seen the uh, ATA come out in favor of, you know, keeping online learning options available um, on two or three separate occasions. Um, and by occasions, I mean like years um, in the making. So if you look at the last, I guess, eight or nine years, you would see two or three specific time periods where uh, they've come out. Um, the same thing with uh, the uh, Ontario Secondary School Teachers uh, Federation. Um, they've often come out in favor of online learning prior to the mandate being introduced. And even um, in the case of the, the mandate, them and all of the other unions came out fairly heavily opposed uh, to it. But you're seeing it become much more political beyond those sort of isolated instances now, uh, as people in many cases have been confounding uh, online learning and remote learning. Um, one of the better examples of, of this is, is the fact that if you look at Quebec, um, you know, Quebec had a, a legal case last year, uh, I guess a year and a half ago now, that uh, was looking at, uh, I, I was actually a group of parents from Montreal that, that sued the government to be able to make online learning available for their kids um, because their kids didn't fall into that very selective, you know, had to have a medical health exemption in order to take online learning. Um, and ended up losing their, their case. They set it up as a charter challenge. Uh, so those are one of the, you know, some of the things that we've seen. And, and a lot of that was due to the politics and ideology around online learning in that jurisdiction. Um, one of the other things that we've started to see, and, and I, I don't know if the timing is coincidental here, I doubt it, uh, but we had a number of jurisdictions where they had these long-term um, studies or examinations or commissions or uh, task force that were examining online learning in their province. And over the past two years, in most cases, each of those have concluded and they've started to implement some of the things that they were finding. Um, so if you go back and look at some of the jurisdictions, I'll use Manitoba as an example. Um, in the Manitoba uh, profile, if you were to go back and look at 21, 22, or 20, 19, 18, 17, uh, for a period of about five years, you would see a line in the governance section that talked about the fact that Manitoba was currently engaged in a review of their distance learning policies and procedures. Um, you know, that review has now concluded and they're actually enacting it. Well. Saskatchewan was another example. Um, BC and, and Randy can talk a little bit more about this, but went through what had intended to be about a one and a half to two year period where they were looking at this that ended up getting extended out over almost a three year period. And then the implementation of some of the changes that were start, starting to happen, which was supposed to go out over a two year period because of the pandemic has now been extended out over a four year period. Um, but we're starting to see some of the conclusions of a lot of those things and the subsequent actions that are happening on the other side. And in many cases, what that's meant is this third point here, uh, that many of these things have centralized the programs or programmatic offerings that are being, um, or they've started to centralize services like uh, learning management system, like course content. Uh, like student information systems. Now, there are outliers in, in this sort of movement, um, you know, Alberta being one of them that had a, a very strong, robust, um, centralized system that um, basically just evolved that down to the districts, similar to what Saskatchewan did uh, a number of years ago. And if you look at the funding mechanism, the, you know, there's a similar grant program put in place in Alberta. Now, in the case of Saskatchewan, they just gave it to every school division. In the case of Alberta, it's a competitive one where you have to apply um, for funds to build capacity. But, you know, it's a similar kind of model to uh, what we saw six, eight years ago in Saskatchewan. Uh, so there are outliers around this. Um, so that brings us to the end of our formal presentation, because one of the things that uh, I wanted to do, uh, knowing that each of you are coming from different parts of the country, different types of programs, was to be able to engage with you guys to be, uh, so that Randy and I could, you know, provide you, A, with specific answers to the questions that 
you had walking in the door, but also to be able to use the that collective wisdom that I mentioned that exists in the room um, so that folks who are on the ground in, in one jurisdiction can learn from uh, what's happening in, in the other jurisdiction. Uh, so while you're thinking about what you might want to ask or a comment you might want to make, I'll just remind you that, and Randy's been doing it in the chat as we've gone, um, all of this information is going to be or is available on the State of the Nation website. Um, we'll also put up a blog post that has the information to access the um, slides and the recordings. And for all of the folks that registered, we'll be sending that out directly by email. But if you do happen to delete that email um, and forget about it, we'll still have um, all of that information up available on the website. 